I understand it, with his uh, one of his grandkids, putting him in college today. So, congratulations to that. Jerry Atkins. Here. Mark McDonald. Here. Joe Zach. Here. Larry Porter. Here. Richard Dreyer. Here. If you don't, um, lots of people have asked me lots of questions uh, recently, and I just want to kind of clear it all up at one time. Uh, my wife, Linda, a couple of months back uh, was given a cancer scare, and uh, we've gone through three surgeries, and uh, I can't even name the tests and number the tests. But at any rate, uh, day before yesterday, she met with her oncologist down at the Sarah Cannon Center, and she is now cancer-free. And above that, uh, they gave her, through some other testing, a 3% chance of ever getting it again, cool. which is almost like nothing. So at any rate, I hope that clears up a, a whole scatter of things. And thanks for all your support. You've been very, very nice in a uh, whole ordeal. Uh, let's get to the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you. Approval of the minutes of the last meeting. Has anybody looked them over? Entertain a motion. I make a motion we approve the minutes of the last meeting. I second. Okay, any changes or addendums to the minutes? Okay, all in favor of the reading of the minutes? from the last meeting, or last uh, special meeting, uh, say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Okay, presentation, uh, rate study report from uh, Mark Randall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the PUAB, uh, we're pleased to be here this afternoon to share with you the uh, new rate design, uh, which was presented to the council last Monday night. Uh, as I mentioned to the council the other night, uh, this presentation will not only unveil a new rate design structure, it will also, I feel, signal the start of a new chapter in the Power and Light story in which IPO will earn a reputation for having low rates to go along with our award-winning reliability. While we still have some additional refinements to add, the rate design you're going to see represents a significant step forward made possible by the rate reductions directed by the City Council, supported by the PUAB, and implemented by the City Manager and staff. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Adam Young with Burns & McDonald, our consultants on this project, to uh, start the presentation. But uh, And then after Adam does that, Robert Stillwell with the IPL staff is going to uh, come up and talk about next steps and uh, a couple of additional refinements. Uh, which I alluded to already, which will further improve the rate design. And of course, we'll be pleased to answer any questions you might have after the presentation. So uh, with that, Adam and uh, Robert, if you'd like to start the presentation, we'd appreciate it. I apologize I didn't get this set up sooner. Okay, I just turned my computer off. So again, I apologize. I'm not doing too well right now. Boy, it's a repeat of council meeting, isn't it? I messed up there. <clears throat> Come on, computer. Want to introduce yourself again, real quick? Sure. Uh, Hi, everyone. Adam Young. Nice to be here again. Good to see. Everyone here? Yeah, talk to a microphone. Oh, so, so everyone goes this home. I can hear you. Sure. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Adam Young with Burns McDonald. Happy to be here today to see you all. Uh, to kind of catch up on some things that we talked about on Monday and, and kind of dig into some more detail uh, on the rate design. Hit slideshow. Actually, you know what? <coughs> I guess that'll work. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let's move that over here. All right, so for those of y'all that uh, were here on Monday, this is uh, 
lot of the same uh, information, but we have made some adjustments based on some things that uh, were asked for us to kind of look back into. And we'll talk through those as we go through the presentation. Um, but yeah, feel free to stop me along the way if we, uh, if we get to something that you want to dig into more detail on. So as we talked about on Monday, again, we're talking about a total overall cumulative rate revenue decrease of 6%, 2% from January, already approved, and then 4%, which was approved in August. Yeah, overall six. Uh, that's over what was in place last year. So we're not talking about an additional six, but this is the overall six and what that future rate design looks like. Additionally, we're talking about rate class consolidation. That's something that the council City management and staff all wanted to see. So again, we worked on that and putting and consolidating some of those classes together, which we'll talk in more detail about. Um, finally, and we'll talk more about this as well, but residential rates and bills on average uh, will be the lowest in the Kansas City area after these changes are made. So, you know, on an average, and we'll talk about what that means more specifically uh, later on in the presentation. On this page, if you would, uh, there are the little uh, the applied across the board to all classes, is that really what you mean? So what we're doing is we're first... Con kind of a yes or a no. Uh, yeah. Yes. It, to the consolidated classes, yes. Okay. So I have, has the August... I'm not sure what it's working. Yeah. Has the the four percent been been implemented yet, or is that will that be implemented with the new rate? When the new rate uh, study comes into next April. Uh, the four percent did go into effect on bills starting in August first, so that is in there also. So we're now at the full. What's on the bill right now is an effective six percent. This rates study that they're developing is to consolidate rates and to include that 6% rate reduction. So I notice that some of the rates will go up. So for people who are seeing a 6% drop right now, they will see a another increase um, that maybe they weren't expecting. I know it doesn't well, go maybe, up for maybe most we went classes. through the presentation and then we could, maybe he might answer some of these questions as we go through it. Okay. I'll we'll just go and let him go through the presentation okay. and then we can I, have. I thought he said, I thought he said it could take questions. During I know, but we, he hadn't even <laughs> gotten past. Yeah, do you want, good morning. Yeah. Do you want me to go do we do questions throughout or wait until the well, end? Well, go ahead. Uh, but I mean, I was thinking uh, you were going to answer some of those questions coming up, but go ahead. If you want to go ahead and do them now, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a good question. Well, we're consolidating rate classes and changing structure. So right now, the rate uh, reduction that's been put in place, um, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's been in, basically passed along through a rider adjustment, essentially in an energy charge. So it's purely volumetric right now. So you had the two, the four. So you're in a mid-year type of arrangement where you're kind of you're getting rate increases throughout throughout the year. So this structural change is to consolidate and then, again, reset the rates. So we're going to roll that, those riders that are in there right now that are attempting to reduce everyone down on a volumetric basis. We're going to essentially set, reset that back into the base demand rates, customer charge, energy charges, et cetera. Does that answer the question? I understand that. Okay. I was just trying to make a point, but maybe that point isn't necessary. <laughs> I think what your point is, are some people going to potentially not have the 6% that they have now? And there is a chance. May it go up. Um, I don't believe anybody will go up above where they are. Our goal is to try not to do that. Will some people not achieve some of the full six? It's possible, but it also depends on their usage. You know, because our rates are energy-based, and some of that stuff is effective right now. You know, somebody right now who is a minimum bill is not getting the 6% on their minimum bill. They're getting the 6% on their energy usage above that type thing. So you'll have some of that that aren't currently now getting the full amount of all that stuff. But our goal is to minimize as much as possible anybody and to try to not have the situation where somebody actually will be higher than where they are currently because that's, 
not what we want to try to do. We're trying to maintain it, but there are going to be some people that will potentially see more and some people that will potentially see less. I, I wish I could say everybody's going to be exactly the no, same. The only way for us to do that would be to take our existing rates and keep them. Okay. And that doesn't help us to yeah. through the consolidation simplification. Good point. Yes, yeah, so a lot of customers right now aren't getting the full 6% because of that because it's all in the energy charge. So low users aren't getting a 6% reduction right now. But, yeah. Okay, so... To, to, to keep going on rate study process. Again, we talked about financial plan a couple of months ago, uh, provided uh, that information and adjustments were made, of course. Uh, we did a class cost of service study, uh, provided results to staff, management, reviewed that. And then, of course, today we're here to talk about retail rate design. So on the financial forecast model and cost of service, those were completed and provided. Um, Again, the 2% reduction was implemented in the financial model, providing revenue reductions of $2.7 million, which are uh, offset uh, by a $2.7 million in, in O&M cost reduction. So uh, that was built into the financial model. Additionally, 4% was approved um, in August, and that results in about $5.5 million in revenue reduction. And that was offset again uh, by cost reductions of about five five point four million, and those were uh, put forth uh, by um, staff to the city. And I think again, we, we've incorporated all those cost reduction measures that were recommended. Uh, overall, again, that means a six percent overall reduction uh, for all classes. That's how it's being uh, pushed through right now. Uh, as as mentioned, that's all being pushed through a energy rider, if you will. So. Um, in an attempt to get the overall 6% reduction, you know, across the board based on use. That doesn't necessarily mean that, right? This goes back to the one before it. Do you really mean 6% for everybody? Not for every single customer themselves. But we're not, so in a class cost of service study, the goal there is to assign costs to different classes. So in, 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 some, uh, in some studies, some classes will see a 1% or 2% after the cost of service is done. Other classes will see an 8% or 9%. But we're the overall revenue by class. So it doesn't mean 6% for all classes. It, so like the residential class in total today, res, all residential customers, they, let's say they earn $50 million or they you charge them $50 million, that will go down by 6%. So that overall revenue collection will go down. Commercial customers, if they are earning or uh, not earning, they're being charged ten million. That ten million for all that entire class will go down by six percent. But we're not doing different things to different classes, which is a lot of times what we would do in a cost of service study and rate design study. You won't always go down across the board. Sometimes other classes get more of a decrease than others. So. For all customer classes, that's not what that means. Go ahead. Um, what do you mean by all customer classes? What does it say? We're saying that the new consolidated rate classes will all go down 6%. Okay. The revenue derived from it. The revenue derived it's from it. That and what's available. What every, you know, individual customers... Not all, I can't say, we, there's no way you could say all customers will go down 6% because it's, again, based upon usage. But all customer classes will go down the 6% as we've been directed. What was uh, approved by the ordinance with the city council with regards to the rate reduction? Wasn't it 6% for everyone across the board? 6% across the board. I don't think it said classes. I think it said everyone. I, I don't know what the ordinance says. Does anyone have it? I don't have that handy. We that should be the driver for me. Okay. If we were to do 6% for all customers, then we can't consolidate or do any of the rate simplification. Right. To do that, we just need to implement our existing rates at 6% less, Yeah, which yeah. is somewhat what we're doing now. It, you would have to take every charge, so whatever the minimum bill charge, the energy charge, the riders, the only way to do that you and you couldn't consolidate anything you'd have you still have 22 rate classes you would still have the same exact structures yeah to that point 
and there. most and when we've always done cost of service uh, rate studies we look at it on a class level you know and people will vary you know just like right now people will vary on their monthly based upon their usage yeah, I, well, I, I think it's all kind of make-believe because did we have a calculation that said how we came up with the 6% reduction? I, I think a lot of people were upset, you know, people on the board here, they were saying that um, it was premature for the 6% reduction and how did the 6% come around? And now we're saying it's like gospel that we got 2% here and then 4 more percent. Was it based on any cost or was it based on just because the council had approved it and now we're going to fold it into this rate study well you want to answer that i can't not sure what the question is was there something scientific that i'm missing that's all i'm asking well no the council picked a percentage of reduction they thought was necessary to get us more competitive and that corresponded to a certain amount of revenue so we cut our revenues and our expenses by that amount so then what they've done is they've applied that to each uh, customer class so that every customer class, so it, it wasn't like, remember the whole debate about whether it should be, which I think his next slide was going to kind of talk about, about whether commercial versus residential should be you know, targeted. And so the council said, no, put them across the board. And this is what this does. It's across the board, all classes. So it isn't like a higher percentage for commercial compared to residential it's six for all classes I, I truly understand what you're you're talking about but the issue is in the newspaper so for example everybody saw a six percent reduction everybody gets their bill the folks that are low users are going to find out they're not getting six percent and i can assure you those folks could care less about anything other than getting their six percent reduction that's all i'm saying and, that, and I think well, that's where the where I, I think, they say there's funny money out there. Well, I, think, I that, think it is. I think to that point right now, those really low users, the way that they've the reduction has been passed through, they haven't gotten the six percent because it's all being passed through the rider. So you had to get it done and, and put in place today or soon. That right. that went into place August first, and we're I, and, you know, so. And, and I don't know what the heck a rider is. A rider. All I know is that. The, the board or the, the council, the it was applied. The, the council voted and said there's going to be there was a two percent and then there was a four percent, and everybody was congratulating um, uh, Councilman Huff. He, he initiated it, but folks, we're telling them a different story. I, and I know you may have a, a real good answer for it, but the average rate payer that we represent are not going to be happy when they get a 02 percent reduction in their the rate versus and someone else is going to get they're going to say the rich folks that have the big houses that have the more utility usage is going to get a larger than the six percent reduction you don't hear that in your mind or maybe i'm just hearing things again I, I i don't know as of right now the new rates the new discount er, that are in there they get a six percent off of their usage and demand and that's what went into effect as of August 1st. And that is 6% overall. If we have somebody who is a minimum bill, meaning they have hardly any usage, they won't see it because the minimum bill didn't change. We took it off the usage and demand as is the way we read the ordinance. So those people, and if for some reason they have a private light or stuff like that, that's not energy based. So we didn't change that. So as of right now, yes, they'll they'll see a line on the back of the bill that says IPL rate reduction, and it'll be a discount. Yeah, I remember I asked for it. So I think it's important that how we communicate to the ratepayers what we have done. Mm -hmm. Somebody that's getting less than six percent is going to be very upset, and Facebook will light up, and it's, they'll get back to them. We can't trust you, and all that malarkey. And, and I don't think that's the case. But at the same time. We sh we need to do what we said we were going to do, pure and simple. Then the only way, to, like I think we said, the only way to do that is to not change any structure and just take every single charge in all 22 classes and just knock them all down by 6% and, and walk away. And then everybody will see a 6%. But you can't do rate class consolidation. And, and Adam, I'm not here to, uh, to argue. Or you just want to make sure it's clear. 
Yeah, okay. I, and I understand. The, the issue is we've promised something, and we're not going to follow up with it, pure and simple. That's what I see. And if that, and I don't see how a 6% reduction uh, that we promise is not going to make it possible for us to reduce rates. I don't know that I would agree with that either. So I'm not an engineer. You're the expert. So continue on. Yeah. Again, we're taking the revenue. I'll kind of get back into the presentation. 6% reduction by class. So if we had six, if we had $50 million in revenue or a hundred million for, re, for residential, that's a $6 million reduction in revenue hey, for that class. But that's not what you're saying. You didn't say it in the, in the one before it. And this one, it says for all customer classes. For the class. Classes. So for class. the class. I'm not saying for all customers. It's not a customer. I'm saying for all customer classes. There's 20, there's going to be 12 <laughs> consolidated rate classes. Not every, every customer. Class. Can, can I ask one question? Sure. Yeah. When they, the city council voted on this for 6% decrease across the board, mm -hmm. then did you guys come in after that to figure out how that was going to come across? Is that how, yeah, is that so how we, it came across? They, we this? were directed to assume an overall reduction. Originally, when I was back here, I think two months ago, three months ago. I don't like to assume. No, okay. It was supposed no, no. to be 6% decrease across the board. 6% revenue right. reduction. What, what was understood was the council said they wanted to see 6% reduction across the board was I think their their language. So what we did with the first 2%, we applied it to the fuel cost adjustment because that was a quick way to do it. But as has been pointed out, that would that's all tied to usage. Is that rate reduction or is that Fuel charge that that you see isn't what I'm really that isn't really rate reduction. That's just applying a discount to that as a like basically a placeholder to get something in quick until we did incorporate it into a rate structure. So now what we're trying to do is incorporate that six percent into a rate structure. So uh, as they already pointed out, some people didn't get the six yeah, percent because I, they didn't have usage or so. Um, this is trying to do two things at once. One is to simplify the rate structure, which was one of the goals, and then to incorporate into that revised structure the 6% reduction across the board. And by that, we meant all customer classes equally getting 6%. So perhaps if you want to make, if the board wants to make a recommendation for a change to that approach, maybe we ought to go through the presentation here at all. Right. And if you think that makes sense, then maybe you'd recommend to go forward with it, or maybe you'd recommend to make a change. So why don't we, I would recommend you go ahead and let him finish the presentation and see just how the rates will change for individuals <coughs> of all different usages. And then you can see whether that substantially, uh, uh, you know, achieves all of the objectives we're trying to do here. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to let him finish right away. I, I hope you finish your presentation, get through this. And I, but my, I'm going to have a question at the end, and I'm going to ask you now, so you might think about it. I want to know how you got to this, when two months ago, you said we couldn't do it. Oh sure, I can okay. Tell you right now. That's that, what I'm trying to find out. Yeah, that's a good, great. It's a great question. We can, we can talk about that. Yeah. No. So what we based on the financial forecast that we did put together, <coughs> existing revenue, existing rates, revenues at existing rates versus the cost forecast. We came in and said that you shouldn't do uh, a decrease of more than 2%. That was the max that you should do. Mm -hmm. That's what we presented. And uh, folks heard that. And then council directed a reduction of four with commensurate cost reduction measures. <coughs> so whatever redu reduced revenue the council wanted, IPL also reduced costs commensurately. So now we incorporated that direction we, re we went into our financial model, into our budgets and our forecast for our test year, and took out $5.4 million in cost and in cost reduction measures. We did that. We also reduced overall top line revenue by $5.4 million. So now we need to figure out how do we reduce revenues by $5.4 million with new rates. So 
that's how we got there. We're we're doing what we've been told to consider. Okay. And we're and that final bullet on this slide is we took these directives of cost reduction measures and revenue reduction and said, how does IPL sit over the next five years based on all the cost cuts and all the revenue reduction? And uh, one, one of the, our, there are two key things that we wanted to make sure is that reserves maintain over 63 days uh, operating expenses and that we maintain our debt service coverage ratios um, in accordance with the bond covenants. So we don't, you know, so th th those are our constraints. And we, so with that reductions in costs and revenue, we're okay for five years. So I, I, I think that's an optimistic statement that we're going to maintain our reserves for the next five years. We know that we were told last week that we lost $5 million in revenue. We know for the previous three years, we lost eight and nine million dollars a year in revenue. So when you when you're seeing those kind of losses per year, just operating losses going on, that has to be affecting your reserves. I, I, I could uh, probably jump in there real quick. I mean, it's a little bit, What we're saying is, is that in the current budget, expenditures will exceed revenues and what we're if we use the the model that they've updated they estimate that's probably about 2.9 million dollars which is exactly the same amount of what capital spending is in addition beyond what is embedded in the operating budgets so what we're saying is if you want to keep up capital spending which is what would be ideal and i talked last time about that capital uh, to depreciation ratio of one if you want to keep that up then you would have to spend more of your fund balance for capital spending. But this, uh, if you want to, uh, if you don't do that, then you don't have to spend down the fund balance. So I guess what we're saying is, is that you need to consider financial sustainability uh, in terms of capital investment to maintain reliability, but if you don't, you can still maintain the 63-day. In either case, you you, operate, you keep the 63-day minimum reserve and the unassigned fund balance that the council requires. Yeah. So that's what we're saying. So if you want to, if you want to spend down some of the uh, fund balance in addition to the 63 days to keep your to have your capital more closely aligned with depreciation to keep your reliability up. That's another question. That's another subject, but that doesn't have anything to do with the saying that we will maintain our operating reserves, we'll maintain our debt coverage ratio over the next five years. I guess, and I could sure we have another it's, presentation it's, probably on that one because that's easily an hour conversation to talk about uh, the the capital to depreciation ratio and the financial uh, spending of. Uh, uh, so I just add. Again, it's the minimum. There's a minimum of 63 days of operating expense. That's our. We have to maintain that. That's what's going to be maintained. So your reserve ratios, your reserves are here. Again, over the next five years, it will reduce, but you will still, over the next five years, uh, be over where your minimum threshold is from a financial policy is targeted. It's hard for us to inter understand because we haven't seen a financial report for 2018. But you wouldn't, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't see what that really in the financial report anyway, which is mostly just a budget to actual presentation. But what we could do is we could have a presentation explaining this because this really is a key point that needs to be talked about because it's a multi-legged stool, this whole thing. You know, reliability is one, low rates is another one. Uh, having a, a low income assistance is another one. You know, financial sustainability and its relation to capital spending is another one, which we should go in. That's another whole hour, I think, we could talk about that. And so um, it just basically he's saying that either you could spend down that fund balance more for capital or not, depending on how you want to do capital spending to match uh, depreciation. But in any case, this presentation, we've got 63 days reserve maintained. So uh, moving on to class cost of service, uh, like I said, uh, overall revenue reduction is 6%. The class cost of service, which is part of the study scope, is to identify which classes are responsible for the cost. So how, 
how do you recover those costs? Do you cover them from residential, commercial, and how much? So we did conduct the cost of service, and we did identify that some classes should be maybe receiving more of a reduction, and other classes should be receiving less of a reduction, if not even some of an in increase, based on how costs are assigned. Um, we studied the analysis that indicate that residential is under recovering its costs. So, on a purely cost of service technical standpoint, they shouldn't be going down by six percent. On the flip side, large general service is over recovering. Um, the rates are too high. Those should be coming down. Um, but that said, uh, we provided the analysis, and IPL and City Council uh, did elect to do an across the board revenue reduction. So we're not going to do a, you know, zero percent reduction to residential and a twenty percent reduction to industrial. It was said each class should go down by six percent in revenue on a class basis. And again, normally we would say that in some instances, maybe the industrial class would go down by, you know, if we were to do class cost service, we'd maybe go down by like nine. And residential may go down by two. But we uh, were told to ignore that. Yeah, but Eddie's heard it. Is there a possibility that that uh, the large users could go down by nine under your theory here? Uh, so, again, are the total so large general service is an example that particular which we'll get into uh, later on that particular class generates a certain amount of million dollars per year that class today will go down by six percent will some users in that class go down by more it's possible with the rate structure which we'll once we get to it we'll, we'll talk through that but there's some that may go down by less than six but Again, in total, it's about it's it's in total it's six percent for that entire class. So moving on to rate design, and um, again, setting aside class cost of service for a moment, and just focusing on on rate design, uh, we're directed to do a rate overall revenue reduction of six. So key components include rolling in the existing FCA, which is the fuel cost adjustment rider, which is currently valued at two and a half cents, into each of the existing rate structures. Additionally, uh, uh, consolidating and simplifying the uh, 22 rate classes into 12. So there's a lot of different classes. We'll go through each of those and, and talk about what that means uh, going forward. Again, the consolidated class, so we'll Residential general use, for example, that consolidated class will go down by six. The residential spacey class, that consolidated class will go down by six. Large general service, they will go down by six. Residential rates and bills going forward um, will be less than GMO rates and bills for each residential uh, class on average. And I'll get into that specifically in a minute because I want to uh, make note of some, some of the things that we did identify uh, over the last day, as we were trying to make sure we were incorporating the franchise fees and riders and et cetera. So we okay. did just dig quick, into some more details. Just there. quickly throw in there that GMO, that refers to the KCPL GMO district that uh, is the one that uh, is that would be Lee Summit Blue Springs, but would not be Kansas City, which is another KCPL part. Oh, thank so you. That's yeah, Kansas City Power Light GMO service territory, right, that surrounds IPL. Additionally, uh, and I guess Robert will talk about this uh, as well uh, after this, uh, the manufacturing rate that is uh, part of the overall next steps in the rate design. So in talking through the rate class consolidation on the left, you can see there's quite a few rate classes. Um, 22 on the left, consolidating that down considerably on the right. A lot of these rate classes have very few customers in them, and they're specialty end-use riders and discounts. A lot of these things have been in place for 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. and the intent here is to roll up these classes into a consol into several consolidated classes, which are more appropriate for electric utility service today. Um, and starting off at the top uh, with residential and residential hot water heat rate. There is a rider in there or a, a, a provision that allows a discount for water heating. This is something that all the utilities in the area have moved away from, including your peers. So consolidating the water heating rate class into residential standard general use. So there's only a single general use rate. On the residential heating rate, there are three different rate structures for folks who have a residential electric space heating equipment in their home. 
again, the other utilities in the area and your peers in Missouri, the other large municipals, they have a single space heating rate. Columbia, Kansas City Power Light, GMO, KCPL Missouri, uh, well, yeah, KCPL Kansas, they all have a single space heating rate. So we're consolidating those into a single space heating class. General service, again, there's several small, there's there, not small, there's several uh, there's customer, several rate schedules which only have a few customers in them. We're consolidating those into a single general service rate. This is your small commercial customers under 10 kilowatts. Think your retail shops, uh, small businesses. Again, these are uh, customers that use about the same as a residential customer. Again, it's very small users. Um, large general service. Again, we're collapsing the schools the sewer pumping, and large general service spacey all into a large general service class. This is those customers that use more than 10 kilowatts. So think about maybe a hardware store or a grocery store um, or maybe even a, a, a machine shop or something of that nature. Those are, your, those are indicative of your large general service customers. So again, there's a lot of end-use rates in there. We're rolling them into one. And then finally, with TEGS, Total Electric General Service, and Schools All Electric, rolling the schools all electric into the total electric general service class. So we're, again, uh, making some consolidation, some simplification, and we'll talk about what the rate simplification looks like as we get into the details. The other large customers, these are uh, where you have very high use, high load customers. We're not consolidating them. They're going to stay where they are. Where they are, And each of these, there's only uh, five, six, and some of these uh, LGSP, LP2, um, interruptible uh, and large power transmission. The other things I want to point out here is on uh, street lighting. That will be going to a municipal rate going forward. Um, and then we will also be putting in a, uh, talking about putting in a um, manufacturing rate or rider, as mentioned before. So the next slides, we're going to get into more of the details on what all this means. So, okay, Mike, Mike. So municipal rate is a new rate, which wasn't, which we never had before. That is correct. And does that include more than street lighting? That's a question for Robert. Uh, the municipal rate is based upon, is, will be based upon what was passed by the ordinance of the needing the reduction of the $665,000 um, that was passed middle of June by ordinance. So what we're going to do is isolate the um, general fund customers and put them on the new ones and pull them out of the various rate classes there are, GS, LGS, that type of thing, to see which one. So, so it'll be a new rate that will be effective. This one rate won't be effective until July 1st because we have what we need to, to provide back to the city for this year, this fiscal year. Rather than trying to bring it in halfway through the year and all that stuff, the plan is this one would become effective on July 1st. So I assume the municipal rate is lower than the rate that they would have been charged otherwise. Yes, because it's got to provide so them IPL savings. IPL is actually subsidizing the general fund. We're putting them on a new rate structure. At a lower rate than they would have been paying otherwise. Right. That's exactly right. That's 100 percent right. Yeah. So streetlight is being eliminated because we're no longer charging ourselves for streetlights, and then we've come up with a new municipal rate for all municipal facilities, which is we feel more corresponding to the fact that the city, uh, if we were a another large employer, this is the kind of rate they'd pay. So this is uh, we put all of the city facilities instead of being on a variety of these different rates, we're in one new municipal rate, which is a good rate, but it's. Uh, it's pretty similar to what we would have uh, done for another large employer coming in. So. so it takes in things like the fire stations and city hall and uh, fire, the police department and that kind of thing. Okay. So it raises, I don't, we don't want to talk about it now, but it raises the whole issue of what the city charter says that IPL can do uh, versus what we're actually doing. But that's a whole other discussion. Okay. So some of the things we talked about on Monday and, and again, just at a, at a high level, a couple key things. Um, 
from a rate simplification process and modernization, more importantly, is first going from a minimum bill to a customer charge. This is something that, again, all your peers do, uh, large munis and the large utilities in the area. So we'll talk about what that means in a moment. Also looking at removing the declining block rate structure where it makes sense um, and transitioning to a flat energy rate. In some classes, we want to continue to maintain a declining block structure, whereas in others, we want to transition to a flat energy rate. And I'll talk about why in those classes we want to maintain uh, later on. So starting off with general use, because that's uh, the one probably that's going to get the most attention. Um, with regards to the general use rate, uh, again, we talked about rolling in the water heating customers, that special end use rate that exists today, into the general use class. Uh, there's currently a lower rate for people who use electric hot water that will roll into the general use class. So, um, again, not a whole lot of customers in there, but there are some, and they'll, they'll get absorbed into that class. Uh, additionally, on the residential electric space heat, we talked about how we're taking we have three classes for space heating or different flavors and types of space heating, putting that all into one going forward. So with regards to the residential standard rate, uh, uh, RS3, that would be the new general use rate. So those customers that don't have electric space heat. We were talking, start, starting off with the energy side of the equation, the off-peak season. Um, Today, there is a declining block rate, which essentially indicates that the more you use, the cheaper it gets. Um, with the tail block, over 600 kilowatt hours in off-peak season being almost 13 cents. And in the earlier blocks, you're almost paying 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Going forward, the off-peak season, when you roll the FCA in, as you can see on the right, the FCA goes to zero. So the all-in rate uh, goes down to 12.35 cents. So we're not providing, not, we're proposing to no longer provide a discount for more use in the winter for general use customers. Similar in the on-peak season, you can see that even uh, over 100 kilowatt hours per month, customers are paying 15 cents per kilowatt hour today. So we're reducing that significantly down to 12.75 cents. So the uh, even the you can see the fir the early block is is fairly high, um, that again gets rolled down and all that gets compiled into a twelve point seven five cent per kilowatt hour rate. So there's no longer an advantage to using more from a cost perspective. Um, additionally, going so those reductions those, those are significant reductions if you look at it on all in energy rate uh, are being compiled with moving from a minimum bill to a customer charge of $10. And that customer charge is a little bit different than what you do today, but this customer charge is substantially lower than the other customer charges, not only in the Kansas City area, but across the state. So we're going with a very low customer charge because we're being mindful of some of the low use customers because we want to mitigate any kind of negative impacts on bills. So I, I understand the elimination of the blocks, and I think that's a good idea. I, I don't understand why you're maintaining a differential between off-peak and on-peak. It's only 3% difference. Why don't you just have a single rate between on-peak and off-peak and simplify it even further? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, we did talk about doing that just in over the course of the year. Uh, what we are trying to continue to do is maintain some seasonality in the rate because it does cost a little bit more. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're still collecting the same amount of revenues in the winter in the residential class as we are in the summer months. But you could average the two somehow and generate the same amount of money. You could, you can, and, and just have a simple I, rate. You could do that. That's. I'm going to step in on that. Um, it's something that I think we probably will move more towards in the future, and something because um, the extreme price differential between on and off peak is still there's still some difference, but not as much. Um, I, we've chosen to keep the on and off to keep some of the seasonality similar to what we have now, similar to what our competitors have. Yeah. You know, it's not to say that we couldn't here in the future go to a single, you know, cross the, doesn't matter which season you're in. Second question, is the pilot included in these rates, in, in, in this figures right here on this page? 
So you, 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 I'll, you, I'll step in on this. Yes, it is. Because what we're trying to do when we're doing our comparison for our existing rates have the pilot baked into them. These numbers, you know, we're still need to pay, possibly tweak them a little bit, but they do would include, yes, the franchise, the pilot fee is in that. So the publish rate would probably be, you know, a customer charge. If we went just a straight 9.08, you know, the customer charge for the customer may actually be $9.08. So in these numbers, they are in there. When we actually publish the rates and put bring forward the schedules, we're going to have the pilot out of it, and it will be a separate charge that will be on the bill. But they are in there right now, yes. So is pilot only times the energy rate and not times the customer charge? No, pilot would include the customer charge too. So it's actually $10 times times point one point oh nine oh eight. No, it would be less, the, the, the publish rates would be less than that. This already has, the $10 is theoretically with the pilot in it. So to get the nine, it would be like 9.08, you know, like $9 times, let's just round it to 10. So you're gonna, you know, if it's $9.10 or something is what your customer charge is going to be. We will back it out when we publish them because it will be a separate line item on the bill once we go through this rate structure. Okay, so. So you're not adding, our pilot on top of these numbers because they're already in these numbers. Okay. Back out of these numbers. Right. But we left them this way for our comparison basis because rather than trying to back figure and change what our existing rates would be without the pilot, we just left them in and we did our rate comparison as if the pilot is there. Okay. Uh, uh, one quick question or comment. Sure. I think this is a step in the right direction by getting rid of all those variations. The more you use, the less it is. Mm -hmm. Because I think that we're getting closer. And this is what my hope is, is that when somebody gets their light bill, they can understand what they're actually paying for that light light bill rather than going to your, your website and getting this whole gyration of different numbers. I don't even know that separating out the pilot is an issue. You're still gonna pay it at the bottom of, at the end of the month, regardless of what you do. Yeah. But this is, is a step in the, the right direction. The one thing I would like to add is uh, back to the, the ordinance that talked about the 6%, it does not uh, indicate anything to do with the class of the mail, of the mail. Oh boy, that's old time. Uh, <laughs> the class rate. It, uh, it says the city manager is authorized and directed to implement a rate reduction for all independence power and light customers of at least 4% starting August 1st, 2019. And I think, Adam, what, as a group, what we're saying is we, we've told the, the residents this is what we're going to do. And I, and I truly understand the logic of the classes, but I, I also understand uh, we're not doing the right thing for all of our customers. The other thing that your presentation will have in there is we want to expand IRAP. Well, with the uh, assistance to the, the low income folks, folks, the people that most need it are not going to get the minimum of the 6% reduction. And I think that's the part that hopefully we're not losing sight of. We may have less folks needing the IRAP if we were actually giving them a rate they could pay. So uh, that's my comment, but I think I applaud you for uh, getting rid of all these different uh, scales on here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and uh, if you want, if we want to consolidate rates, if we want to simplify rates and reduce rates um, and make sure every, we can't do both without, you know, if we want to consolidate and simplify, get rid of declining block, you know, get rid of all our different classes, um, we can't maintain making sure every single customer gets a 6% bill reduction. There, those, those are two different things. They're, again, if you, you, can't, you can't charge somebody something different and guarantee they're going to use less. I understand where you're coming from and what the ordinance I appreciate that. says. I really do appreciate you. We're, we're, we're working to reduce overall revenues by 6 and each class by 6%. So we're not, again, that was our, our directive. Yeah, and, and I guess design. what... I would say in, in response is that we should be able to do the calculation of what it should be so that everybody 
when it came to this is what your bill should be, and then we subtract out 6% from that. So I do think there's a way that we could do it, but it, and keep the, the structure the way you have it. It may mean a change in some of the it, rates. It, it really wouldn't because if you maintain a declining, if you don't maintain a declining block, your very high use customers, if we go to a flat rate, um, we by just going to a flat rate from a declining block, there's going to be people that don't Adam, see I stand corrected. You're absolutely right. I, I don't Thank know how you. you get away from that. It, not only in this class, but the others. Yeah. Thank you. I think that I, I agree with you. I think it's unfortunate. There's some of us who voted against the 6%, the 4% at this point in time, and some of the council members also voted against it, realizing that this was going to happen, that mathematically this had to occur, what you just described. If we hadn't, if we had had voted the 6% decrease after we created the new structure, then we could have done something differently. But, but uh, it is what it is, and, and I, I understand that it's, it's a problem of communication, but there's nothing else that we can really do about it. You can, yeah, you can see, I mean, the customer, the customer that uses you know, 1,800 to 2,000 kilowatt hours per month. They're going to see an increase. Well, they won't see an increase. 10 cents to 25. That's that, about the same, 13. right? You got to add these two together to get to that. Oh, but so again, the very large users, just by getting rid of your declining blocks, see an increase. But coupled with an overall decrease, that actually works itself in a, in a, in, a, in such a way that's actually beneficial on uh, the high users. By getting rid of the declining block structure, so this is where you can see in the winter where there's a steep discount for high-use customers um, and overall class reduction of 6%. Um, customers that run the range from very low use, so it's just going down to the bottom here, the average user of um, based on normalized weather uh, usage of, I think it was 2017, the average user will save. Of course, that will save six percent. The average, the mean, if you will, the very low use customer of three hundred seventy-two kilowatt hours per month. That's their average use based on a profile. the The profile the IPL had for uh, our our weather data usage. So we look at the monthly usage profile. The average customers, they will even save money. And the high high users will also save money as well. This is coupled with getting rid of the declining block structure. So, again, this this captures, I don't know if it's 98% of all bills, the vast majority of all bills going down to some level. And this is what I do want to point out. One of the key things that did change, and I'll talk about the next slide in a second, we did go back. We were using uh, another usage profile of 800 or maybe even a little i don't remember what the exact number was but we went and uh used the 2017 billing usage profile data so that middle number is a little a little lower than it was before but so, the overall general story the impact is is still the same so i i i computed your percentage drops sorry I say I computed your percentage drops between low, average, and high. Sure. So the low users are dropped 0.2%. Okay. Your yep. average users are dropping 6.3%, and your high users are dropping 7.4%. So the, the, those who are really benefiting from this change are our high users. Everybody saw a decrease. The low users saw very little. You know, it's eleven cents. Uh, the biggest use, the biggest users are the ones who got the biggest benefit, which is we're ba we're balancing things here. I, I understand <laughs> the I understand the mathematics. Right, it's just the way it turned out. I don't I don't presume that you wanted the high users to get the best benefit. Not really. But but that's the reality. That unfortunately. High-income people are getting the best benefit out of this. I'd like to. You say high income. It's it's high usage customers. But usually, the high income people have the biggest houses. They have the biggest houses, but they also have, can have more insulation, the more efficient appliances than say somebody who's 
maybe of low income, but may have a house that doesn't have the same insulation, same appliances and all that type of stuff. Because I know I'm going off experience. I had um, Herb Webb, who used to go out and meet with customers, went to a lady who had a high bill complaint. Um, she was living in a mobile home that had holes in the walls and was using you know space heaters and had high usage because she was trying to fight through what environment's doing. So I, yes, we found a slight correlation between income and usage, but that's not necessarily a full correlation. Right. I, I'd fair. like to point out like, my, even my own use. I'm an, an engineer. I retrofit my house, make it very efficient. My own average use in my house is less than the KCPL average use. And again, engineer, I work at Burns and McDonald, doesn't mean that I'm whatever. But again, I don't, you can't correlate income and use. It, there is a loose correlation, but... There's a correlation. It's not 100% correlation. It's definitely not 100%. In fact, it's probably more like maybe a, at best 50% R squared when you're looking at the... If you do a... Um, I think we did actually do that analysis, regression analysis. It's not a very high correlation. and It's not something that we would ever be able to hang our hat on because there's a lot of very high income people that live in small apartments and there's a lot of low income people that live in large uninsulated homes that don't have money for the energy efficiency and retrofits moving right along so I, again this is really just to point out the uh yeah so i do want to point out here i did present this slide on monday night um, again to compare where ipl is uh today I'm sorry, uh, going forward, the proposed rates versus GMO uh, typical bills. One of the things we did go back and look at, because we did get some feedback on the franchise fees, so we went back and looked into each of the additional riders and fees, and we did uh, identify that we did not use the uh, correct ResRAM rider. It's one of the three riders for KCPL GMO. We updated that and updated all of our calculations, so they are slightly different. That what was presented. I'm going to full disclosure there, but the overall story is that the average Independence Power and Light general use customer is still has still has a lower bill than the average GMO customer with uh, the same franchise fee tacked onto the GMO rates. We were trying to put those on an apples to apples basis, and that is how. Uh, things that have been done in the past for other presentations made to PUAB and they don't have the same they don't have the same finance uh, franchise fee out in Blue Springs as we do. I, that's they're five percent more at nine. That is correct. But and when we've always done our compare those. Okay, we're not comparing how their bill is on at their location. We're comparing, and we've always done our comparison how they would be within the City of Independence because how much. What control does IPL have over the franchise fee? So are we needing to, if there's a difference, the city has a different franchise fee. Are we needing to make up for the franchise difference because the city has a different franchise fee? If that's the case, then we need to redo some things. What we do is what we can control. Going forward, I will say we have the franchise fee in here because that's how we've always done the analysis. Going forward, when our new rates don't have the pilot built into them, we won't be dealing with franchise fee because we're just looking at base rates. And anything such as sales tax, franchise fee, anything like that that's city chosen to do will not be included in any of our I don't, I don't want to extend this presentation any longer than I have to. But, guys, when you're making a statement that says our comparison says that we're lower than GMO, we are not lower than GMO. If we're you not. Take, if you it, take out. We're talking yeah. about rates. It just. The only reason why they the they added the uh, gross receipts tax onto the rates here was just so we could have this historical comparison. So these uh, proposed bills here they track to the prior slide, mm -hmm. which also track to current, which had it already built in there. In future, you will not see any pilots or any franchise or gross receipts tax in rate comparisons. We only did it in this one just because so these would tie together. So a point a point to that is if in the future, as Robert mentioned, if you pull out the franchise fee out of the rate, so you reduce all IPL rates by nine percent, right? You'll put them on the same equal footing as GMO without the nine percent in our analysis. So I thought would, the whole purpose of comparing with GMO is 
so that we have a, a good um, it is. comparison economic development we do. It, it, that we can, we, do. we can compare. Instead of losing the plant to Blue Springs, we'll be able to keep them here. But if you're putting in our franchise, our uh, pilot, onto their numbers, we're, we're selling a, a different story. Well, and that's that we talked about that yesterday, and maybe even pulling it out of both sides of the equation, so you can just see what the raw rates are. Because the franchise fee, the franchise free fee is really what the city decides it wants to either charge a utility to do power to sell power in this jurisdiction, or whatever it tax on to IPL. I, I truly understand that, the, and the okay. point is, the average ratepayer has to pay the pilot. That's right. Pure and simple. It's a part of the rate. Yeah. It's a part of the rate that goes back to the general fund. And I, and I get all those things. And it's very and it's very important to me that we maintain a very strong general fund. But when we make allegations or allegation assertions that our rate is going to be less than GMO, I knew something could not be right. Well, you know, Gordon brought it looking. up the other day. He thought, I mean, if, if, well, you had, missing, if you had the same reality, rate wasn't. between GMO and and Independence Power Light, if if the energy rate, the KP kilowatt hours was the same, the customer is paying nine percent greater, and Blue Springs customer is paying five percent greater than that rate. So there's a difference of four percent. That the way you're calculating that, you're ignoring that. You can't you can't put the gross receipts tax onto a rate comparison. You you got a customer rates. is paying a difference. You're having. This, it's you're two looking different at the things. First, it's two the, different things. From the perspective of the customer, this is the rate study doing. talking about what the rates should be based on a cost of service study, and this is what the rates should be. So the now, only way to do this fairly, to your point, is to pull out the. Uh, in, our, in our opinion, is to pull out the, the gross receipts tax of nine percent on both sides of the equation. No, and and right. then apply the two different ones. Apply nine percent on an IPL and a five percent on a GMO. Exactly. You could do that, but okay. So, do we need to, in all future, we need to compare us to each individual city, as well as what their sales tax rates are. That's the, that's it gets very complex because the the five percent is in Blue Springs, it's seven percent in the Summit. Mm -hmm. So it, but but and we'll have this, to, this we'll table here is is not correct in terms of you're saying this is what the the bill is going to be this no. is not what the bill is going to be we've always we've always said in comparison if they were serving an independence if gmo was serving an independence they would be paying that franchise fee and that's okay if this is how we've in the 12 years I've been here, this is how we've always done the analysis to make it an apples to apples basis. Yeah. And going forward, when we don't have the pilot in there, we'll do our analysis based upon our rates. Um, sub, you know, we don't get into, you know, what the sales tax rate is or the franchise fees going forward. And if if the PUAB wants us to do that, then I guess we'll have to develop a new comparison based upon each individual city, based upon their franchise fee. We'll have to keep track of what their sales tax rates are so that we can get what their Robert, bill might be. We've presented that to you two, three times now. It's available through the U.S. Energy Information System. It puts all those costs in there, and it's basically saying, here's all the receipts, here's all the energy you sold, and it breaks it down, residential, commercial, industrial, and what else do I have? You know, transportation. Yeah. Uh, and it will show you a comparison. Okay. It does it for you. But and I'm, it also will identify how we compare with other municipally owned utilities, not only just investor owned utilities. Right. And I agree. That's that what EIA my goal is information for us to get to that point. But based upon, if you look at that EIA information, you'll also notice that GMO customers use on average about 200 kilowatt hours more than IPL customers. I, I, so, do, bring that, yeah, so, so I do have that comparison because I think we do. So when GMO, you get their average rate per kilowatt hour that they've report, they report all of their electric space heating and residential general use, and they pull it all into one. It's not, it's not segregated out, is it? But it they also provide all sectors. So it know, will put it all together so, so we can say, so, how does Independence Power and Light compare in with all the numbers to GMO, can see Power and Light, um, we gotta, we Columbia, gotta look and at, Springfield? We got to look at GMO Space Heat, 
and GMO general use as compared to IPL general use and IPL space. You have to put them on an apples to apples basis. If we take the GMO average rate per kilowatt hour, and that's apples and oranges combined, <laughs> and we combine it, and we compare it to just general use over here, which is what this is, it's not a fair comparison, which is why we did general use compared to GMO and space heat compared Adam, to GMO. But you're saying that having different franchise fees is a fair comparison? I don't see that. Either. If we pull them out, we talked about that. If we pull them out of this compare, like if in the future you pull franchise fees out of the analysis. And I think, you know, if we want and we can have them, we can pull the franchise fee out. So it's just on a rate basis. And I would be no, more than I, happy to do I, that. I think you have to pull it up and then multiply the. If you want to use 5% for, for Blue Springs and Green Valley and 9% for. Because the, the customers in Blue Springs are paying 5%. The customers in Independence are paying that. That's a 4% differential. That That's a big different. That, that's as much as what we're talking about, is a differential between the. The two rate paints. Okay. But I would also, uh, going back to the EIA, they use more on average. So do we need to inflate their usage up? Well, I mean, but that, that's... Because we're, if we're trying to compare to a customer there, and they have potentially larger houses and use more energy. So do we want to... But, but that, 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 that's affected by your actual... Your differential in terms of, of your, your structure we're, that you we're, have. We're it? probably Why answering there? different, we're pro it's different things. This is all in, that EIA information is good information. It's just not all the information. As we were talking about, it could be two guys with the exact same rate. One could, ha could have a higher percentage than another based on consumption. So it isn't the best, I mean, it isn't everything. So what we're trying to do here is just, we're trying to show our rates are going to change and we're going to apply the 6% reduction. And so we were just trying to do a comparison of what we're doing now versus what we're going to. Mark, the and EIA the rate the that difference we're going to set is going to be The EIA like numbers are not doctored. No, they're not doctored. And we can go and say, this is what the, they report, what you guys reported to the U.S. Energy, Com US Energy Department. And this is what GMO uh, reported. This is what Columbia. Okay. This is Springfield. Yeah. And I'm say, just telling you that what this, is the rates? I'm just saying that if that shows, that can show a higher percentage of difference. That's misleading, and therefore that's not the. It's in, useful information, but it's not the be all and end all because we're talking about the rates. I and can I can I um. Back to this, not saying we can look at the analysis, but one of the things I'd like to bring up, GMO has a customer charge. We don't. Is that correct? So you're taking that customer charge in theory and dividing, adding it to their energy charge and spreading that customer charge out over the usage. Would you agree with that? Yeah. The numbers that I have I know. here but include if you have a all charges. Okay. Sales tax, it has franchise fees, it has every cost associated that a customer would pay, and it simply divides it divides it by how much is actually sold. Right. And it comes up with a rate. If we that's why it's as clean as information as you're gonna get. Okay. Except if we it, have the exact same rates as GMO, let's say we have the exact same rates as GMO. And we on average you if we have GMO's rates and we on average use 200 kilowatts less, our customers, because we have smaller houses, apartments, that type of things. Our EIA number, when you divide it out, will be higher than GMOs, guaranteed. The reason being is because we have, that customer charge is spread out over less kilowatt hours. You have that fixed charge up front that is not energy related, that's going to be spread out over in, over energy usage. I'm just trying to make it as simple as possible. Okay. I, that's all I was trying to do. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, moving along. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Let's talk about electric space heat. Um, so electric space heat, a lot of the same things we talked about before on general use, starting with the energy rate in the off-peak season. Again, there's a fairly steep declining block rate structure, uh, going from 12 cents to down to four. So uh, we wanna, with electric spacey, it does 
cost less to serve an electric space heat customer. They're using a lot of use in the winter. Uh, so we don't want to completely eliminate the declining block. If we did, for those very large users in the space heat class, you would definitely see some bill increases. So we had to keep, take that into consideration to mitigate that, even with a 6% class reduction overall. And recall, we're, we're actually consolidating three electric space heating classes down into one. Um, and then, again, simplifying the rate structure so we only have two, two blocks. Um, so all in, the average winter rate, if you do the average of the blocks, will be going down. Even in the tail block, you're almost at $0.07 cents for use over 900 kilowatt hours. Going forward, it's uh, going down to 6. And then if you look at any use uh, under 900 kilowatt hours uh, with the FCA tacked onto that, uh, those low-use customers uh, won't be seeing a, a decrease in the energy use charge. So, again, we're balancing to make sure we don't negatively impact the low user in the electric spacey or the high users. We're trying to do a few things here. Um, but again, overall energy charges on average on high and low customers are going down in the winter. In the summer, again, there is a declining block already, uh, or, or I'm sorry, today. Uh, moving away from the declining block in the summer, this is consistent with other rate structures. Again, not only KCPL GMO, KCPL Missouri, Columbia Water and Light are several examples. Uh, they do not have a declining block rate structure even for um, in the in the winter in the I'm sorry in the summer season. So most utilities again don't use a declining block rate structure in the summer. Um, and again, eliminating the FCA. So you can see today your residential space heat customers are charging almost uh, anywhere from uh, fourteen and a half cents thereabouts, maybe a little less than the higher blocks down to 12.7 cents, so a, a significant reduction in the energy charge. Um, but again, we're uh, going back to the minimum bill, moving from a minimum bill charge to a customer charge of $10. Uh, again, keeping the customer charge very low because we're again, trying to be mindful of the low use customers so that they don't have that increase. So again, probably could justify more, but we, we want to keep it very low definitely lower than all your, your peers in the area. On the residential electric space heat typical bills, uh, again, uh, everyone uh, from the average user uh, down to a, a customer that's using half of the use uh, will see a bill reduction, um, uh, as, as noted down below, over the course of the year. So the average user I would see a bill reduction from the current rates today to the proposed rates of, of about $9 per month. Uh, and you can see how the low users' bills would reduce uh, and the high users' bills would reduce as well. So again, making some critical changes to the rate structure, the declining block, and the customer charge, rolling in the FCA, but also trying to make sure we keep folks from seeing bill increases as well with some of these modernizations to the rate structure, which are, again, we're not doing anything that's drastically different than what everybody else is doing in your uh, in this region, particularly with your next door neighbor. Any any questions on that? Okay. On again, the GMO comparison won't beat this to death because I feel like we just did that, but it's the same analysis. Uh, again, a little bit better uh, as far as compared to. Um, uh, in this particular class, but again, uh, bills are going down. And, um, yeah, I think this is, again, one of the key distinctions here. When comparing GMO, we can take out all the franchise fees, but when comparing yourself to GMO uh, or to anybody else, you need to compare their general use rate to your general use rate and their space heat rate to your space heat rate and not all of it lumped together because these customers do use a lot more so we need to compare if somebody built an electric home, all electric home in Independence versus an all electric home in Blue Springs, how would that compare? Because they would both be on a electric space heating rate. Um, yeah. So um, moving on to general service. Uh, again, we're rolling a few classes together here. Uh, churches and hospitals, general service space heat, and uh, churches and hospitals all electric 
Again, some of these specialty end use rates that were put in place years and years ago, rolling those into the class uh, that is uh, makes sense for them. Again, going from a general service rate, uh, similar story, there's an existing declining block rate structure. So those users who use a lot more in that class see a, a lower average all-in rate. So even though, so those users that use over 800 kilowatt hours per month, today that 13.2 cents plus the two and a half, you're about 15 cents. We're taking that down to a 13 and a half cent rate. So we're rolling in the FCA into the energy rate and then doing a significant reduction while uh, eliminating the declining block rate structure from that structure, which again, uh, rewards those who use more, uh, even though it doesn't necessarily cost more the more you use. Additionally, also implementing a going from a minimum bill to a customer charge, a fixed monthly customer charge. Again, we did compare this to the others in the area to check to see our, how much, making sure we are lower than the commensurate class, that uh, small general service class that GMO has today. So we want to make sure that we're not doing anything that we're not, we're putting in as low a customer charge that's reasonable uh, and introducing that as opposed to a minimum bill. Would you go back to the to the, to the one before this one? This one. Uh, yeah, this one. It, and we don't need a big discussion about this, but it just seems to me the churches that sit there seven days a week and don't do much over hospitals that operate 24 hours a day uh, at a high rate are lumped together in kind of a strange fashion. Um, speaking to that, the most of the big hospitals are on the LGS or an LGS PV rate. The big hospitals, a lot of the so ones what that are. What does that mean? I mean, how does I don't know what that means. They're on a rate structure now that is better off than being on the churches and hospital rate. They're on a demand based rate, so they're better off on that. Just like the high schools, many of the big high schools are on the LGS rate because it is a cheaper rate for them than to be on the churches and hospital rate. Just because they're a church, a hospital, or you know, a school doesn't mean they; those are the only rates they can be on. We generally put them on the best rate possible. Yeah. So our big, the big customer, you know, like I said, the big hospitals, the big churches, all that stuff are not on these. These are the smaller ones, churches, or uh, for hospitals can be like a dialysis clinic or things like that. Right. Again. So, again, no. moving away from end-use rates and type, the type of customer, if you will, uh, rolling them in just on a, a more of a service and usage characteristic rather than what's in the building. So, just looking at some typical bills, an average customer in the general service class, 670 kilowatt a month is uh, today what they use on average. And then also, again, pushing it uh, down to see... Uh, what's the impact to a low use general service customer and a high higher use general service customer? That's plus or minus fifty percent to see what their bill impact is by the reduction. So we're looking at a range of bill impacts. On the large general service customer class, again similar to the small general service. Uh, there's a handful of customers, meters that are on uh, specialty rates. Um, so rolling those into the large general service class. Um, we also have, of course, education. As Robert mentioned, a lot of schools are on the LGS rate already, but there are some meters that are on an education rate. So rolling those into a the LGS class. So again, moving away from an end use rate um, from the commercial side into just the large general service class. On the LGS side, I'll talk about a couple of structural differences that are going on here. Um, start with the energy side of the equation. We're rolling the FCA, again, similar to the other classes, into the energy charge, uh, into the hours use energy charge. This is a slightly different billing mechanism that's used, uh, not only by Independence Power and Light, but Amber and UV, KCPL and GMO, I think KCPL and Missouri uses this as well. Uh, but uh, we're in, so that even in the, the lowest block, they are charged today about eight and a half cents, and that will be reduced down to six and a half cents. So a significant reduction in the energy charge going forward. On the demand charge side, there is currently a, 
again, a declining block rate in the in the demand charge. So that demand charge, uh, again, the larger user you are, the cheaper it gets from a demand charge basis. We, we want to move away from that. So we have a single demand charge for all LGS customers, irrespective of their size. So again, they still get charged based on how much they use for demand, but it's they're not in, it's not in a graduated declining block scale. Uh, I do want to point out, we talked about getting away from declining block rates. Well, this may look like a declining block energy rate on the bottom. It is not necessarily a declining block rate. It is an hour's use rate. And the way that it works, uh, I wish I had a calculation in an Excel spreadsheet that can show you better. But essentially, it rewards those customers with better load factor. Um, so the more you use for a certain amount of demand, it gets cheaper. And this is something that, again, it's not necessarily a true declining block rate like you would see with residential customers, but uh, an hour's use rate that rewards customers for uh, high utilization of the load. And it makes it more cheaper. So your larger, say, manufacturing, data centers, et cetera, they will have a overall lower use, lower average rate the more they use. And that will be consistent going forward. Oh, and also, again, moving away from a minimum bill to a customer charge, a low customer charge. And for an LGS customer, that's not necessarily, uh, it's a very small portion of the bill. And that number is uh, was derived based on the class cost of service analysis. And again, something that's very low, uh, implementing that customer charge rate. So when looking at typical bills, uh, an average user in the LGS class is about 15,000 kilowatt hours per month. So they would see about a $130 bill reduction. Uh, what really matters with this particular rate structure is not use. Uh, the more you use or less you use, you're going to see a um, similar percentage reduction if you were to calculate the percentages. But what does matter is the load factor and how often you're using that demand. So for that customer that uses 15,000 kilowatt hours per month, but only 43 kilowatts of peak demand, they will see a, a, a greater, uh, slightly greater reduction in their bill than a customer that uses um, almost twice that amount of peak demand, but the same amount of use, which is consistent with other rate structures. Uh, and then again, also with your own rate structure, the more you use, uh, um, the better your load factor, the lower your overall bill. But again, we're moving to a demand charge structure, which is part of the reason for that uh, difference. On the uh, other large customer classes, again, when we start talking about your interruptible rate, your large power transmission service rate, a lot of the changes we just talked about on the uh, uh, large general service class, we're doing the same kind of structural changes there. The rates are all very similar as to how they're structured. Um, TEGs, again, I just kind of going, going through this, that those are specific customers for those who aren't aware. Those are customers that meet certain use requirements. Again, proposing similar changes to that um, that we talked about with LGS. And then large power service and interruptible, those are customers that meet, you know, again, uh, those customers that are higher voltage. They have they receive power to higher, vol uh, higher voltage, not 12 or not 4160, but uh, something quite a bit higher, less infrastructure to serve them. So their rate structure, again, there's only a handful of customers on there. So it, out of respect to those customers, we didn't put typical bills uh, within this presentation. Um, but again, their, their revenues would go down or their uh, charges going down. And then finally, the uh, manufacturing rate uh, would, of course, um, uh, be, be developed and implemented. And that's something we'll, we'll follow up here after these slides. So just to, again, to reiterate things we talked about at the very beginning, overall reduction in revenue, rate revenue, total rate revenue of 6%. Uh, across the board to all classes in total. So each class gets a, redu a reduction. Um, consolidation and restructuring, again, like we talked about, getting rid of declining block, rolling certain classes into others, schools, churches, electric space heat, et cetera, the things we talked about. The consolidated classes will be going down um, by 6%. So with consolidation and restructuring, um, that was our directive and that was what we were told to do. Uh, and then again, residential res residential rates and bills on average will be amongst the lowest in the Kansas City power Kansas City area um, after these changes are made. 
and yeah, you all were present for their lightful discussion on franchise fees. Any other questions? I got one. I got. I got. I got just a couple of questions, uh, Robert. Maybe you can answer this. Uh, at what point will the FCA change and go up? Uh, the FCA will be rebaseline. We'll basically take what existing costs that are in the current and that are be, that have been incorporated into base rates, and it will be calculated on a annual basis. Is our goal is to move forward with a true up if necessary. Uh, everybody else around here, we're on a monthly basis. Uh, GMO and F Kansas City Power and Light are generally on like a six, four to six month basis. So it'll be calculated. But once we implement the new rates, the goal, the plan is that it would be set at zero for the first year. And then once we do the true up and we'll evaluate, did we recover? And based upon our projections going forward, does it go up or does it go down? Because costs could go down. All right, you did say yearly you're going to do it? Our, my my desire, because I get, selfishly, I get tired of having to do this every yeah. time at the end of the month, but doing it on a forward-looking basis, basically off of our budget type thing to see what our costs are. So it'll be based upon these are what our projections are. This is what we expect our fuel costs to be. This is what is in our base rates. This is what we need. Okay. So, yes, it'll be on a annual basis so that we don't change this dramatic changes on a monthly basis right so that our customers have more predictability upon what their rates are going to be okay that's good also i have one more question i some of my other cohorts up here did too i, I looked at the 12 consolidations on the rates and I, I think that's great we've simplified it a little bit but i the way i look at it on the municipal rate, private lighting, traffic signals, they're all, I think you could reduce it down to four rates, mm -hmm. consolidation. To that point, did you okay. did you review or take a look at or know of the uh, uh, rate uh, study that was done in uh, 15? I, we did review that I mean, about a, a year ago. Did you ever? So, Ever notice that there were four <coughs> classifications in that? Four classifications for what? In the rate study on page four of the 15 report, there's only four classes. Uh, I'm not, oh, that was the recommendation to go to four classes? Yeah, that's what we're asking. Yeah. Why, why couldn't we put these, divide, well, three, it'd be three groups. They all look together, a residential, residential space eating, and general service. You uh, ought to be one rate. You, you could. You would see some significant uh, impacts to bills if you merged all the residential customers into one class and charged them the same rate. You would see some significant increases to your residential electric space heating customers, like 20%, 30% probably, if I had to suspect. Same thing with your large general service and general service customers. You could see some very significant increases and we are already consolidating a lot to get to eliminate end use um, but the the classes that are remaining uh, are really based on service characteristic and classification which are commensurate with what other folks are doing particularly your neighbors as far as having a uh, again residential and residential spacing that's very normal particularly here in the Midwest a small general service for those small commercial customers and a large general service customer class. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I, I appreciate this and I, I, I agree with most of it except for the, the issue about the, the pilot. But what I don't understand is we've always assumed that our rates, our IPL rates were significantly higher than GMO rates. I'm talking probably 15, 20% higher than GMO rates. Now, with a 6% reduction, we're seeing our rates being 6% less than GMO, around 6%, you know, it varies by class and so forth. But that would almost imply that our rates previously were about the same as GMO in order to see that our rates are actually coming down. So, so how, how 
I know that's a complicated. No, I, you guys are. You're not going to be six percent cheaper than GMO going forward. Okay, so it'd be slightly less expensive, but not six percent cheaper than GMO. So, but even let's say it's only about. Two, it would almost be almost the, the same. I mean, so just, let's say it's two or three percent. That that you're not going to be one percent. I don't care if you the. the if if our GMO rates if our rates were higher than GMO by 15 20% which is what we were led to believe that's what customers were complaining about and now we've got a 6% reduction and our now our rates are below GMO I don't understand how that calculates out that that can be possible it all comes down to the franchise fee I think is where well it also comes down to the the whole thing about that EIA yeah uh, percentage thing you know it's really is it exactly right to just divide revenue by kilowatt hours to come up with what kilowatt hour cost is compared to that isn't really when you're doing rates it's not you could have the same rates in two cities and they'd have a different percentage on that eia rating depending on how what their usage is so we were trying to just say okay that's an interesting bit of information and that has been used to say oh we're like 20 percent higher but if you're talking about the actual rates, on your use, we're not 20% higher for residential. In fact, like you say, but without the 6% reduction here, we wouldn't have been able to say that we're lower than GMO for residential. And we thought that was something worth celebrating. And if and I'm sorry if it seems like it's not exactly the the latest number story, on EIA I think it's worth saying worth saying that we now have rate rate not revenue the latest by number hours. on EIA. Let me finish. For residential was just updated today for 2018. We were 14.28 percent, 14.28 cents per kilowatt. GMO is looking at 11.28 cents per kilowatt. So that's a significant number. I, I, I wish I just knew. What did you say it was? 11. 11.24. 11.24 for GMO? Yeah. Does that include the franchise fee? Yes, it that includes all their all franchise costs. fees. Right. Your, sales tax. Sales. I've got a. It does include all their franchise fees by city and yes, sir. added to their rates. Let me read to you what EIA and says. And current riders. Current riders today. Can I just? Sure. No, I just want. Thank so you, we're, Adam. We're not doing wrong. God bless you. Yeah. Revenue entered on line one is gross revenue and includes the revenue from state and local income taxes, energy and demand charges, customer service charges, environmental service surcharges, franchise fees, fuel adjustments, and other miscellaneous charges applied to in-use customers during a normal billing operation. For the course of the year. Okay. Those are 2018 numbers. They don't include- Yes, sir. They're 2018. They don't include the rate, the 2019, the new rates. No, it's just the 2018. New, they don't include the new, the latest FCA, no. the new fuel cost adjustment numbers, the new res rem riders. It includes you know, all costs. 2018. 2018. So 2019, the riders after, are all different. After I get together here, let's maybe share that with yeah. you. So yeah, happy, I'll give you a copy. Yeah, and I think the other thing I want to point out again, and this is, I think it's important because we don't want to ignore this, is that, again, they their average user is significantly larger. And I think, again, we brought this up a number of times. Their average, they, they have a lot more electric space heating customers in their all overall residential class. They have two residential classes, generally use space heat. If you take the total of that use, again, they have a lot of old electric space heating homes, large homes with electric space heat. Their average use per kilowatt hour, or use per customer is much higher. Then at yeah, the number for Columbia and Springfield are yeah. significantly different. They're even worse than what our our gap is with uh, GMO. What is what is that? I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Talk about this after. Okay. Um, what does the board want to do with this uh, consolidation from twenty two to twelve, and uh, some possibility? This is uh, this was two thousand. Well, I, I my my question is answered on the, going to the four. I don't think we can do that. Uh, I say we go ahead and approve the 
the 12 consolidation, uh, that's progress, the way I look at it. So I'll make a motion to that effect. A second. Yeah, the, second. The, the only question that I have, I think it needs to be a discussion at a different time, but why we're having a city rate that gives benefit to the city over other users. And, and I think that's a charter violation because the charter actually says that IPL cannot subsidize the city and we are in effect subsidizing the city. Well, I'll agree with you on that. Uh, we're subsidizing the city, but uh, where'd Dan go? Matt, how much does the fire department pay you for each hydrant? Huh? That's uh, built. That's built into the rates. That's right. It's it's a safety thing, and and it's my personal opinion. I shared it with my good friend uh, Mark. Uh, uh, street lighting is a safety issue, also. I want to be able to look out my front door and see the druggies walking up and down my street, <coughs> so I can call the police and they'll show up in forty five minutes. <laughs> and, uh, we did not discuss that. We didn't discuss that. Okay. Uh, but I, I, all I'm saying is, uh, the this this charter has been violated so many times, Garland. If you look in the past, I've lived here all my whole life. They violated it so many times. They've been to court on so many things. The only thing that's going to correct any of this is if they have charter amendments or go to the public with a vote and change the charter. That's my personal opinion and I hope you respect it. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Any discussion on the motion? Except the 12 consolidation on the, as in this report. As in this report, yes. And I second. And we already okay, have any second. further? Okay, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Here we go. Moving right ahead. Uh, reports from the uh, different companies. Thank you, Adam. You're dismissed. <laughs> yeah. See you Not next week. See you. Yes. <laughs> you Not for long. Do you have a report? Yeah, just one thing. Um, we did have our 60% design meeting last week uh, regarding our biosolid upgrades, the uh, lime stabilization, and we're right on schedule moving forward. Next month, uh, middle of September, we will be doing our 90% and uh, hopefully uh, be done with this project by uh, middle of next summer. Any questions? Yeah. What's yeah. 42nd Street? <laughs> Uh, I think we talked about it is a public works issue. I did talk to the city engineer this morning, though, just, just to get an update, see where they're at. She said they're looking to break ground and uh, begin the construction phase in October. October. So they're going to council on the 2nd of September for approval um, for the contractor that they selected. Okay, or will be selecting, you. I should say. Matt? Uh, as far as uh, one, Mike. Oh, oh. Okay. Oh, sorry. I guess I need a... Uh, one positive thing to note, uh, this last month we had about 9,743 calls with an average hold time of 4 minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, that's an improvement from last year. At this time, we were about 25 minutes on an average hold time. So we're getting it down. We're working on it. We're continuing to improve in that. Uh, the other thing, just a couple uh, notes. Uh, over here, our, our little, uh, our, I shouldn't say little, our pilot project that we're doing on James Downey, we've got that main all installed. We're uh, tying over services. It's It's been approved for in-service, uh, so everything's passed on that. Trying to get that wrapped up, we'll get some costs together so that we can see how efficiently we did that and in, in moving forward with our main replacement program. Um, one last thing, uh, July, we pumped about uh, 940 million gallons of water sold, and that's down about 5% from last year at this time. So that's where we're at. What was that leak across the street here? Ran for a day or two? That was us flushing the, the newly installed main. We have to flush our mains for two days and have two consecutive okay. clean samples. Sort of. Okay. So, so. 
That's what that was. Any further questions? This is when we start getting our monthly reports, like Mike. Mike, Mike. Mike. All right. Yeah, I thought that he'd be here today, but uh, we just, I'll find out. We should be getting them every month. I just, I don't know what is the hold up for this month. I'll find out. Okay. Any further questions on water? Okay, IPL? Yeah, I mean, we've already talked a lot about IPL. The only thing I want to add was you asked last time, you wanted to know whether the payment had been uh, received, for the transfer from the general fund to the uh, power and light fund for the real estate for the communication center, and that was transferred on June 30 uh, last year, 18. Okay, any further questions to IPL? Okay, any comments from the board members? Just, I got more. Go ahead. I just want to thank uh, Robert for a fine job he did. Uh, Putting this all together for the straight. Uh, I'd like to credit. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I have one comment. I, I don't know whether to make a motion or not. I'll ask Mark. Uh, would it be possible? I, I, I understand we get you're giving us reports, uh, but a lot of times it's well everything's working all right. Uh, could we, like Matt did, on the, uh, how many? gallons you pumped out of the how many main breaks you had and repaired and uh, if you made any new taps you know new services and from the power and light I'd like to see a report up front before we get into any actual topics uh, what any new poles set transformers repaired uh, and from the sewer any sewer breaks uh, which you might have repaired I think it I, I found out from talking to a lot of people they a lot of people hear this board meeting and watch it and I think for your benefit it will help the public to know that when they turn on that faucet there's a lot more work goes on for you to turn on that faucet and you're doing that work in the same way with power and light you turn on your light switch, it isn't just because you got a switch, it's because these guys put up a pole and the same way when you flush your stool. I hope you flush. <laughs> anyway, is it would what I need to make that a motion? To that, well to that point, Mark, we were getting what you guys were calling a dashboard report, and that just stopped uh, two or three months ago. I don't know why uh, or what, but uh, it would be nice to have that kind of thing available again. Well, that's primarily financial, but like I said, we're, but go ahead, Mike. Tell them There's a, a, a city manager monthly um, report, I think, that, for lack of a better term, that goes out um, that water and, and WPC send information up, just some data, some numbers. Um, I have mine right here. I can share the, the July numbers, and I think Matt has his July numbers if you guys would like to hear that. Or just forward those on, or we no, just... let's, it's four fifteen. Let's do it next month. Okay. Or I'd like to see it in paper that it's one of the things that comes yeah. out, and we get to do a dashboard report thing like we were doing. Okay. I so we we do produce that report, so we can just make it available. Okay. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions, Mark, for you. Um, this board uh, voted some time back that uh, an audit be done of the overtime that's being uh, used out, out at the uh, plant. And I'd like to actually begin to use, to, to say excessive overtime, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but are we doing anything about an audit about that? We've asked for several months. Well, the last meeting I gave you a report that it detailed the audits that have been done been done and which are going on so like I said the management uh, the management analyst for the city is doing an audit right now of that and uh, yeah we provided you a report already on uh, that so um, I think there's going to be in other words the answer is yes we've we've got the that's un it's been done, but it's also an additional audit is currently underway by the city's internal uh, management analyst, who is now moved into the IUC to help him in his work. So, 
Uh, I'd say yes, but I'm just not prepared to, okay. so let's to move talk along. about recommendations tonight because it's really premature because there's a number of, of things that are going to be recommended. Just a couple of other questions. Uh, you're uh, what we would normally refer to as a, an exempt uh, employee, aren't you? Correct. Okay. And so you know the difference between exempt and non-exempt. That's a standard right. practice. Do we know how many, or could we get a list? We got a list of who got the most money. Can we get a list of who's exempt and who's not exempt? Where that yeah, I thought is? that was in that report, uh, but yeah, that's not a that's not a problem at all. I mean, it did show, I believe, in the report who was okay. exempt and not. Is it but, a standard practice that exempt employees get overtime or excessive overtime? It's not. Uh, well, it just depends. I mean, I've never been. Uh, it's kind of a new concept to me here, and of course I don't get it. So let's be clear about that. <laughs> <laughs> what it, what I think Jeff Barnett mentioned to you when he reported on this several months ago, the reasons why they do it at IPL, and it had to do with just the, uh, for example, people going on storm restoration, linemen who are not exempt, and they would be getting overtime to have a supervisor assigned to them. So there was different. Uh, uh, now, whether, uh, I, I mean, if you want to have a report on that again, and this point, is another thing that's being evaluated. The point is, so, Mark, is that it appears from the reports that you've given us in the last month or so that there are a whole bunch of people that, uh, that look like they're exempt or would be exempt because of their title and, and rank, and yet they're receiving a ton of uh, excess overtime. And it's hard for me to understand how, if you don't, if you're not running the store and the store's not selling anything, how you can have overtime for operating the store? Well, you know, I think, let me just say first off that if you want to look at any subject in depth, just tell me and we can get it on an agenda and we can have a report on it. Because I really hate when you, uh, to give you half answers. And when we don't know what it is that you're wanting to know, we haven't had a chance really to research it out very well. what I'm but what at, I was trying to what I'm say getting was, at is clear, and that is we have a lot of exempt employees out there who are getting excessive overtime right. for doing nothing that the plant is running. The plant is not running. Well, what I hasn't been running for some time. Yeah, no, and it's and like we got a big overhead out there of people who are getting lots of overtime for a plant that's not running. That's what I'm getting at. And. Uh, and I think that we've already discussed this and we do realize this. It isn't something we don't know more. about and it's something that is being looked at. All right. But you also had a bigger question about overtime for not for exempt employees in general, which we got into that several months ago. Pretty much then it was in the context of that storm uh, relief issue. So remember that whole conversation. So we'd love to rehash it again and we can give you up to date on where the management analysts and all these because it's in other words, what you're saying is is not unknown. It has not been uh, is it's not unknown to the city manager's office. He's, okay. he's I don't have a so. beef with these guys doing on going on mutual aid, or the con the the, the uh, collective bargaining group. Those people are doing their jobs, and when they're called in, they they're called in. I'm talking about the people above them who are getting lots and lots of overtime, and the plant's not running. That's as clear as I can be about it. Mark, would you, excuse me, is that all right? Yes, Mr. Chairman, could you give us that report on non-exempt, or the exempt employees down at the uh, plant? Sure. How much overtime they're having and have it for us for the next meeting? Very well. Or before? Well. I'll have it at the next meeting. We can talk about it. No problem. We'll put it on the agenda for next right. meeting Great. to talk about. Uh, and, but I just, uh, the, the interesting thing here is this very topic has been discussed by us recently. Uh, I think that you've probably seen some communication from someone about it, probably why you got that communication. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is we're aware of it, looking into it. It's not new news, but we'll give you an update of where we're at on it. Mark, I, is that fair? I appreciate what you're saying, and I know what you're saying. Again, I've lived here all my life. I was one of those that got some of that standby overtime at the water department. So I know it happens, and we want to know why, and if it's causing a problem, 
and it needs to be corrected. Simple as that. Yep. Uh, likewise, I was on the you know T and D. Likewise, I was I, I was a superintendent at T and D, and I was involved in this. And industry wise, uh, basically, the way it's set up at Power and Light. Uh, superintendent is basically the general foreman in construction or any other major electrical place. Your general foreman makes more money than the people under him, and it's that simple. Uh, I know they give these titles and all that, but actually, uh, the superintendent does a lot of work physically, uh, in storms and so forth, helps out with everything, the safety, the whole deal. So it's not just like, uh, uh, I mean, industry-wise, this is all across America. Uh, it works like this. Now, I don't know what titles you, you give these people, but generally, like I said, it's just more or less your general foreman, and your foreman and your are broken down into crews and so forth. And he j generally just is the uh, general foreman over the other four or five or eight foremen who are out there. It's that simple. And he gets commensurate pay, usually five or ten percent more, depending. It just goes up in steps. Uh, they, uh, let's just say offhand, the lineman, whatever he's making, the foreman makes five percent more. The general foreman makes five percent more than him, and that's just the way it is across the board in industry. Now the titles, uh, I don't know. You can put any titles on them you want, but uh, basically that's the way it works. Any other comments? Second. You need a second. Second. Anything else? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thanks for being here, gang.